who are we and what are you doing here? So this is the August general meeting of the East Bay Astronomical Society. Uh, thank you all for uh, attending. I hope you're having a nice summer so far. Um, and uh, I don't really have much in the way of announcements, but I do want to mention that I'd like to try something new tonight uh, if uh, people are willing. Uh, when we're ready for questions, what we've done in the past is we've allowed you to post the question in the Q&A section of Zoom or in the chat of Zoom. And we've kind of proxied your question to our speaker, but uh, Zoom has some nifty new features that they've added. And one of them allows me to click on your name and uh, hit allow to talk. So if you would like to ask the question directly uh, live in your own voice, uh, that might be nice. Yes, it allows for some discussion and follow-up questions on your part. Um, and if you want to do that, uh, click the button that says raise hand, and I'll see a little hand pop up next to your name, and then I'll be able to uh, allow you to talk. Uh, once again, though, we're going to take questions uh, after, um, after the talk. And there will be plenty of time tonight for that. So uh, feel free to engage in, a, in um, as long a discussion as you'd like on any of the topics in which you're interested. Um, and I guess that's it for me. Uh, Dave, I'm gonna turn it over to you for introductions and I'm gonna okay. go uh, hide in my corner here. Well, the first thing I wanna say is I wanna to apologize to tonight's speaker because apparently I have reversed his first name and his last name. So. Uh, this is, again, one of those cultural things. Um, uh, so uh, his real name is, and correct me if I screwed it up again, Dr. Gorgian Varujan. Did I get that right? No, uh, Varujan Gorgian. Gorgian being my last name, Varujan being my first name. Oh, then I did get it right in the write-up. Oh, good. Okay, yes. Excellent. Okay. And uh, so he obtained his undergraduate degree in astronomy at Caltech in 1992. So he's still just a kid, in my opinion. Um, and his PhD at UCLA in 1998, which uh, is, both of those are two institutions I, I very much love. I went to one of them uh, and applied to one, but they were wise enough not to accept me. That was Caltech. Um, and he went to work uh, at JPL on the, on the Spitzer Space Telescope project in two, from 2003 to 2020, which is floating behind him uh, even as we speak, and has been there ever since. And uh, and his research interests range from supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies, which are really, really cool, in my opinion, uh, to planets orbiting around nearby stars, which is even more cool, in my opinion. I love the study of exoplanets. And, and he's very uh, involved in outreach and education. And I have to say that I am very much looking forward to this talk because I am very interested in the history of JPL because I have friends who work there. And I remember a lot of these missions. And I first started learning about JPL when I was 10 years old. And we had the Ranger project being launched towards the moon that would crash into the moon early 1960s. And I remember watching Gene Shoemaker wearing this really cool black leather jacket that he had. So without any further ado, tonight's speaker, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce his name. Don't worry about it. Up. That's fine. Thanks <laughs> Thank you time. very much. Thanks so much, Dave. I'm so glad to be here. And um, hello, everybody. I'm glad you could join uh uh, this talk on this Saturday night. I am going to start sharing my screen and speak about um, history of JPL. Again, this is a very uh, brief history. There's uh, JPL has done a lot, but I'm just going to go sort of the over, overall the basic structure of it. And then, you know, if you have any questions, just remember them and you can ask me at the end of the talk. I'll try to make my talk not too long so that um, um, we'll get uh, as many questions as possible towards the end. So um, let's uh, start talking about rocketry. Uh, and rocketry in the 1920s and 30s was an amateur pursuit. Professional scientists and engineers did not engage in it because it was not the realm of serious science or engineering. Uh, particularly at the time, it was regarded as something for science fiction, which at the time was called scientific fiction. Uh, and it was for pulp magazines and pulp novels, and so not something to be taken seriously. So it was amateur rocket uh, enthusiasts who, who worked on trying to make rockets work. And the way they worked on it was that they would try things, and then they would have these clubs, and clubs would exchange letters with each other, try and figure out 
you know, how things were done, what was succeeding, what wasn't succeeding, and so on. So in this um, area come two young boys, basically, uh, two rocket enthusiasts, one Jack and John Jack Whiteside Parsons uh, here on the left, and <coughs> excuse me, his friend Edward Foreman, and they were very much into rocketry and lived around in Pasadena, and they were going to John Muir High School, but they, and they loved all the things that exploded, and they worked on fireworks, and then they started working more seriously on rockets, and then they, afterwards, they started working at the Hercules Powder Company, and later Halifax Explosives, and so they were gaining a lot of valuable experience on things that go boom, um, and in 1935, they both went to a talk at Caltech, which was very unusual to get a rocketry talk at Caltech. Uh, again, remember, this is not serious science uh, pursuit. This is not a serious engineering pursuit. So uh, over there, they met a young graduate student named Frank Molina, who, who was very much interested in uh, pursuing rocketry in the aeronautics department. So uh, Frank Molina convinced the head of the Caltech aeronautics department named Theodore von Karman to allow them to work on rockets by combining Parsons and Foreman's practical experience with the theoretical capabilities that were available at Caltech. Now, von, von Karman provided funds and some lab space for them to do their rocket experiments. So they were, they were often going together. So, uh, in comes in a man named Fritz Zwicky, who was an astronomer at Caltech, also a Caltech professor. Uh, and you must understand that although uh, for the establishment of Caltech, it says established in 1891, uh, it was not as established as Caltech in 1891. It was a, a, through Polytechnic University and um, it did not have a very you know stellar scientific or engineering record. And Fritz Zwicky, uh, and several others who'd been brought in, in particular originally by uh, Robert Milliken and George Ellery Hale and um, a chemist named Noyce, they were the critical people who started and they started attracting these top-notch people like Zwicky and Von Karman to come to Caltech to make it a first-rate science and engineering school. And so Zwicky was not having this rocketry work. He said, you know, we're trying to be, you know, reputable science and engineering place and von Karman was uh, funding science fiction. Fortunately, von Karman was both smart enough to know that, you know, what he was doing and had the stature enough to not be bullied by Fritz Zwicky. Many others were not as lucky. Fritz Zwicky was quite the bully. Um, so uh, von, von Karman allowed the experiments to continue until there was an explosion on campus, not terribly surprising. And so the idea is that they asked them, all these young um, uh, experimenters to leave the campus to do it someplace else. And so this is the birth of what's called the Suicide Club. And so they moved to what's called the Arroyo Seco, which is far enough from Caltech, particularly at the time, <clears throat> excuse me, um, uh, that there was really nobody that they were going to be bothering with their experiments, but it wasn't too far because they still had to lug out a lot of experiments and equipment and, and so on and so forth. And so they started doing their experiments in the Arroyo Seco, which is basically this wash um, uh, down the dry river bed that um, not too far from Caltech. <coughs> Excuse me. So let me just do a quick diversion now on the ideas behind um, the difference between jets and rockets, in case anybody doesn't know. The critical thing about any kind of combustion, not having to do with jets or rockets, but any fire, any combustion requires two things, a fuel and an oxidizer. So that oxidation is combustion, this chemical reaction that um, happens with your fuel combining with an oxidizer, with oxygen being a good oxidizer, but it doesn't have to be oxygen itself. Uh, it's this transfer of electrons very quickly between these elements uh, or molecules. And so um, at the time, jet research was really very well accepted and people were pushing on jet engines because this was a way to go get away from propeller engines, provide a great deal more thrust where you get fuel that you put into your jet engine and then the um, oxidizer is the oxygen in the air. So it draws in the air, mixes it with the fuel, combustion happens, you have expanding gases and then that pushes you forward. Rockets on the other hand have to work in space, therefore they can't be dependent on their uh, fuel or oxidizer to come from space. So what they end up doing is they carry their fuel and the oxidizer together and they mix them. The combustion happens, expanding gases happen, 
go one way, your rocket goes the other way. So in 1930s, jet engines were a legitimate area of research and rockets were not. So um, when the, then the US Army hears about these rocket experiments and comes to talk to them because they're thinking about this idea of putting rockets on propeller planes to help them give this boost to take off from shorter runways. And certainly potentially if there's a war, usually you're not getting to make the best runways and they're not the longest. And so what you would assume would be these were would be called something like rocket assisted takeoff units. But the, the US Army Corps of Engineers was not going to be seen funding rockets. So they called them JATO units, Jet Assisted Takeoff Units. Uh, so even though the Caltech rocket engineers were working on rockets, and they're working on rockets for the Army, the lab itself was named the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, even though as far as I can tell, no actual jet propulsion research has ever been done at Caltech. So you can see this very odd thing just from the very beginning. <clears throat> So anyway, making these small rockets to attach to planes was a very hard problem. So because sometimes they would work and sometimes they would just explode and that's not a good thing to have uh, happen on your plane. Uh, and it was Jack Parsons who figured out how to stabilize the solid rocket fuel on these uh, JATO units to help the planes take off, but then also to be able to um, uh, store them long enough because you're not gonna just always have them be in perfect condition. How, how well can you store these things and how well uh, how long after you've stored them can you still use them? So this success led them to create these JATO units and they created uh, the Aerojet Corporation. Again, not the Aero Rocket Corporation, but the Aerojet Corporation to make the JATO units for, for the US Army Air Corps. And all the Suicide Club members became executives of the new company. Um, <clears throat> the JATO success showed how brilliant Jack Parsons was, but he was also very strange. He was very much into the occult. Um, and used to do incantations and try to communicate the demon dimensions via, uh, before rocket tests. And in fact, there's where the Euro Psycho is, there's this thing called the Devil's Gate Dam. He didn't name it, it was just called Devil's Gate Dam. So he was very big in using that. He was a big follower of Aleister Crowley, for those who are familiar with that kind of um, uh, beliefs. And so um, <clears throat> that was not something that. Um, was very well looked at at Aerojet and he was basically pushed out of Aerojet Corporation. And effectively they were literally erasing from him from the history of Jet, JPL. Um, and then he also dabbled in many other things. Um, just as an aside, I mean, he had, uh, um, uh, he, 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 in his dabblings in all these uh, occult kinds of things, he also came, uh, picked up a rather odd fan for a little while named L. Ron Hubbard, who was very much, you know, they, they became friends, but then their friendship fell apart once L. Ron Hubbard um, took off with Jack Parsons' wife and his boat. Um, but eventually uh, Parsons and his wife reconciled, but he was dabbling in many things. But then unfortunately, when he died by making a special firework for a friend of his, and it became quite the Pasadena um, uh, scandal at the time. So how do I know all this stuff when there were Caltech and other legitimate institutions were trying to erase uh, Jack Parsons name from the history of JPL? Well, you know, <clears throat> it's a long time and later and this great book came out uh, about 10 years ago now, maybe a little bit longer called Strange Angel, The Other World Left Life of Jack Whiteside Parsons, John Whiteside Parsons. Um, uh, or, and, and then it was on CBS streaming now, it's on Paramount Plus. So there was a 2018 miniseries that they started doing. And I think they did two seasons. I don't know if they ever got to a third season. But if you're interested in knowing his history, you can read that book. But of course, if you're interested in his uh, occult, there's also a separate book. It's called Sex and Rockets. You can actually look that one up as well. Um, but there's another way of looking at, you know, uh, Jack Parsons' contributions to JPL, and that is, that he, his name can never be erased from JPL because a lot of people at the time said actually JPL stood for Jack Parsons Lab. Anyway, but JPL continued without Jack Parsons and they went on to develop several surface to surface missiles for the US Army. And that was their main thing was they were developing, you know, during the World War II, they developed various different kinds of missiles and then uh, started, put, started pushing forward even further after the war. Of course, in 1958, actually 1957, Sputnik was launched. <clears throat> and so they came to the US Navy, <clears throat> excuse me, to put the first US satellite in space. Unfortunately, that failed. Um, 
since uh, Werner von Braun, who was the German rocket scientist who was brought over from the Nazis after World War II, was working with the US Army. And so he was meant that he was work, working with JPL. And he had set a uh, rocket for a long duration storage experiment because he felt that the US Army should have been doing it, not the US Navy. But because the Navy's rocket failed, he had this rocket ready to go. And JPL had also been working with the University of Iowa professor, James Van Allen, to actually create an experiment to go in there. Again, they were not supposed to, but they were doing it anyway. But very quickly, it was you know the U.S. was ready go, to go again. It wasn't you know it wasn't instantaneous, but uh, but that long duration storage rocket ready to go, the experiment ready to go in 1958, JPL was uh, critically responsible for the first U successful U.S. satellite in space, um, and also that because of that experiment, we know that the Earth has radiation belts around it, and it's named after James Van Allen, who created the experiment originally. Now, because of that, President Eisenhower formed NASA, and they asked, you know, JPL, do you want to stay, make rockets for the U.S. Army, or do you want to go on to be a part of this new agency? And JPL became a part of the new National Aeronautics and Space Administration. And their main task was, from the very beginning, for the, for the robotic exploration of the solar system. Um, the very early ones, uh, there was, the, uh, of course, very quickly, the, the plans became to go to the moon. And so, well, we're not going to just send people to the moon without actually sending robots there first and studying what we're, what we're getting into. Excuse me. The first was the Ranger program, which didn't have flybys and crashes into the moon. And then the Surveyor program was to better study the moon by landing on it. And so all of these details were being figured out. Uh, by JPL and by the robotic spacecraft that JPL was sending to the moon. And here, in fact, on Apollo 12, they landed in close enough to, I think this is Surveyor 7, where they would go to it and picked up bits and pieces of it and brought it back to see how it had survived on the moon over the years. So, and since that time, JPL has led the way in studying our solar system with robotic explorers. And so I'm going to go through the highlights of the JPL missions to give you a true breadth of what JPL has contributed to it. Uh, this is, um, I've tr it's not a, I mean, I've tried to make an exhaustive list, but it's not, you know, there are many sort of joint projects or, you know, smaller contributions that JPL made to other missions that, from other, uh, both other countries or both, uh, parts of other NASA missions. But these are sort of the ones that JPL had some of the largest portions of, or did the whole mission itself. Uh, note that these are not, I'm not talking about all NASA missions, I'm talking about missions that JPL was a part of. So let's start off with the studying the sun. Um, there was a joint mission with the European Space Agency in 1990 called Ulysses, which uh, examined the poles of the sun. So JPL had a big participation in that. In, and then there was the Genesis mission, which went and collected particles from the sun and then returned to the earth as a sample return for us to study. So literally just touching the sun. And then the Stereo mission was sent two spacecraft forward and backward in the orbit of the earth to get 3D views of the sun. Of course, once the, now they're beyond <clears throat> beyond the sun, and so that way, at certain points, you lose the 3D, but then you're still getting views from behind the sun. Uh, JPL had a flyby of Mercury, uh, so that was very early on. So we got only a portion of Mercury image because of that. It wasn't until a mission that out of NASA Goddard that had an orbiter around Mercury that we got a much better sense of the full planet. But the earliest one was Mariner 10 in 1973. Venus. Um, we JPL sent a mission to do the surface mapping of Venus with a radar to penetrate the, the clouds. And so it analyzed basically almost the entire planet to get a sense of what the structure of uh, the surface is, because of course Venus is covered by this thick layer of clouds. Now, this is the thing I want to uh, mention. I'm not going to go through all of these things, but um, both for JPL and for NASA, the planet to which we send the largest number of missions and the largest missions is the Earth, uh, mostly because that's the most important planet. For me, that's where I keep all my stuff. Uh, but at the same time, obviously, that has the biggest impact on uh, understanding the Earth has the biggest impact on our lives, on the lives of everybody, environment, and uh, as we go for, forward and um, trying to figure out how best to treat our planet. So both for NASA and JPL, as you can see, there's many, 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 many missions that are already in orbit uh, that JPL has either instruments on or runs the full mission. I will say I I'm going to point out one of these uh, missions. It's called the GRACE follow-on. 
So uh, that's one of my favorite missions, but just because I like the idea behind it. So the original mission was called GRACE, Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment. So it has these two spacecraft that are bouncing um, uh, radio, or initially bouncing a signal between them. There's initially radio waves in the second one and the GRACE follow one, I believe there's a laser as well. So they're just measuring as these two, the distance between the spacecraft and it's a polar orbit. So that as they go around the earth and the earth turns underneath them as a spacecraft is coming over a particular region of the Earth, if there's more mass there, the first spacecraft gets a little bit more accelerated by all that mass. Let's say it's coming across the Himalayas, for example, there's more mass there, it gets it. And then the other one gets accelerated a little bit afterwards because it's trailing it. And so that change in acceleration between those two spacecraft allows it to map the mass of the Earth. That's the gravity recovery part. What, is strange that you would think about as the climate experiment, because it's not observing clouds, it's not observing the ocean directly, it's not observing anything else. But the reason it is such a powerful climate experiment is because we have winters and summers. We have winter in the Northern hemisphere. So you get a lot of ice formation on the North Pole. And, and then once you have you know, summer in the Northern hemisphere that melts, but then suddenly you have all this ice building up on the Antarctic, which means there's a mass redistribution that goes on for the Earth throughout the Earth's year. And so because of the transport of water. So GRACE and now GRACE follow on map and trace that change in water from water to ice in the northern, northern hemisphere and then water to ice into the southern hemisphere. So that way, by following the mass, we have seen the fundamental changes that climate change has brought about because this is not about taking a temperature does not taking about the depth of the snow or anything. This is just pure mass distribution. And what we've seen very directly is the ice every year, the ice on average is getting less and less. And that's because the mass in ice is getting less and less and less. So that I thought was one of the most clever ways to really do a great measurement of um, how the Earth's climate is changing. So let's go on to the next one, Mars. Mars has been one of the key factors where people have been wondering about and um, uh, wanting to find out more about. And there are many, many missions that uh, JPL has sent and there have been many, very many failures. Uh, there was the or original Mariners 3 and 4, then Mariners 6 and 7, Mariners 8 and 9, and then Vikings 1 and 2, which was the most, even yet, uh, ambitious mission to Mars with two orbiters, two landers simultaneously. These were not rovers, by the way, they were just landers. That means they landed and stayed where they were. But they did experiments to see whether there was a potential for um, life on Mars. And it was the experiments that they did were rather inconclusive. Uh, but the reason why they were able to do such uh, uh, ambitious Mars missions in the, in the mid 70s is because um, of the Apollo missions. And in fact, when John F. Kennedy had said, you know, we want to put a man on the moon before the end of the decade of the 60s, a lot of scientists had were getting ready to oppose that because they felt that um, it was just a stunt and it was going to divert enormous amounts of money away from any kind of scientific research. And so there was a deal that was made that, you know, to support the human exploration of space by going to the moon and all the other things that would come later, that NASA wouldn't be as dedicated to doing scientific research. And that has really often, not that the human exploration hasn't done science, but there's been a critical part that has definitely been always um, that robotic exploration can do. And that sort of the consequence of that promise to do that was the Vikings one and two mission, two orbiters, two landers simultaneously. Of course, unfortunately, until the 1990s, there was no other mission <clears throat> as again, the whole Apollo program had uh, been reduced, then, be, um, and in addition to that, uh, you know, the funding for NASA had gotten lower on all fronts, both human and uh, robotic exploration. And so there was the first mission to go back to Mars was the Mars Observer, but it, there was a failure en route. And then Mars Pathfinder, which landed with uh, the pathfinding, was to do the airbag landing to have a cheaper way of getting to Mars and also to have a rover and see what we could find out. And then since then, we've had many, many more missions. There's the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity, the Mars Phoenix Mission, uh, Spirit and Opportunity Rovers, uh, Mars Global Surveyors. Before then, in the late 90s, early 2000s, we did have two mission failures, Mars Climb Rover to Mars Polar Lander, where Mars Phoenix was basically a reflyer of Mars uh, Polar Lander, Mars Odyssey, Maven. These are all missions that were either uh, 
have all succeeded in one form or another. Of course, more recently, of course, we had in um, uh, Mars Cube One, which was Marco, where we had, uh, that um, went there with Mars Insight, and Mars Insight was a way to measure uh, Mars quakes, basically, to see the interior structure of Mars to detect the vibrations that are going through Mars once it gets hit by micrometeorites or even bigger meteorites. And of course, then more recently, we had the Perseverance rover, which redid what Mars, um, the Curiosity rover did and has been, was very successful. And then this time around, of course, it had the Ingenuity uh, Mars helicopter, which has also been incredibly successful. So, um, of course, Jupiter is biggest planet in our solar system, and we've sent multiple missions there, but there's a pioneer program there. Voyagers 1 and 2 went there. Ulysses, because uh, to go to a polar orbit, actually had to go out to Jupiter first, use Jupiter gravi Jupiter's gravity to swing it outside of the plane of the solar system, and then so go back and look at the poles of the sun. Cassini, on its way to Saturn, uh, that was its primary mission, but did have to go by Jupiter and get a gravity assist. And so we did a Jupiter studies there. Galileo orbited Jupiter for many years and sent a, a probe down um, uh, into the atmosphere of Jupiter. And now currently we have the Juno mission, which is orbiting um, Jupiter with uh, doing gravit uh, gravimetric measurements to sort of study the interior. It has multiple instruments to study underneath the clouds. So it's a, it's, it's a continuing mission and it's been very successful. Saturn, definitely one of the prettiest, if not the prettiest planet in our solar system. Um, Pioneer 11 went to uh, Saturn, Voyagers 1 and 2 went there. Cassini, of course, went there and orbited for many, many years, and then dropped a Huygens probe on its largest moon, Titan, which has a very thick methane atmosphere. And it looks like it does have uh, methane and ethane lakes uh, there. So it's a lot colder. So all the water is frozen, but other liquids are now, uh, other gases are now in liquid form like methane and ethane. But then beyond that, uh, there's only been one spacecraft again from JPL that has done that exploration. The Uranus was explored with a flyby by Voyager 2, and then Voyager 2 went on to study Neptune. Um, uh, for uh, what we can call dwarf planets and asteroids, there was a mission called Dawn, and JPL pioneered uh, an ion engine. So remember, when we were talking about rocket engines, we have a fuel and an oxidizer. And if you, know, if you want to go in space and change your trajectory, um, you need to have, you know, carry both of them. Or, uh, but uh, in this case, Dawn uses an ion engine, which means it just uses um, a gas. In this case, it's xenon. And it's solar electric propulsion with those uh, solar panels that get powers from the sun and ionizes the gas. And puts them into a magnetic field, and of course these you know, particles, like charges, repel and are just pushed out very powerfully. Uh, but the amount of force that that generates about is about the weight of a piece of paper on your hand on Earth. So you can't use ion engines to take off from the Earth. You still need a chemical engine. But once you're in space and there's no friction, if you get this very tiny but still constant force, then you can actually start going around. Uh, and visiting other uh, uh, dwarf planets or asteroids. And here's the critical thing. I think you had to talk about this the last month. Uh, the critical part of this is until now, we usually don't go into orbit around a planet and then break orbit and go around, you know, something else. That's literally a science fiction. That's, you know, Star Trek, you know, put us into orbit, Mr. Sulu, you know, break orbit, Mr. Sulu. But that's what we managed to do with the Dawn mission. We went to the asteroid Vesta, stayed there for a while, and then spiraled out and went to the asteroid series. Um, so a great deal of uh, uh, the solar system became available to us because of this ion engine. Um, then we've sent uh, studies missions to comets. Uh, the Stardust mission went through the tail of a comet and collected the dust of the comet and then put that into a capsule and sent it back to Earth for us to study. The Deep Impact mission, we studied the interior of a comet by smashing something into it so that the interior stuff would come up and it would study it and spacecraft around uh, from the Earth. And in fact, the Spitzer Space Telescope also studied it. And Voyagers 1 and 2 spacecraft have continued to travel and have, although we often say they've left the solar system, they haven't because they're still within the gravitational attraction of the sun. But they have left where the um, gravitation, the um, influence of the sun has ended, which is the heliosphere. That's where the gases from um, 
the sun or impact the gases from our galaxy. And so there's this thing called the heliopause and Voyagers 1 and 2 have now passed beyond that. And so they're now in intergalactic space. Uh, and so that's, again, those two spacecraft are, you know, were built at JPL. And the communication times right now is about 20 hours one way. So it takes 40 hours to have a two-way communication with Voyagers 1 and 2. But we've gone even beyond there. Uh, um, JPL has been involved in multiple telescopes. The first infrared telescope uh, in space was the Infrared Astronomical Satellite. It was a joint US-British-Dutch program. It was based, uh, it was done out of JPL and its science center is based out of Caltech. And then there was the Whitefield Infrared Survey Explorer that was launched in 2009 to do full infrared survey of the sky, similar to IRS, but much higher resolution and a slightly different wavelengths, shorter infrared wavelengths. And then they continued that mission on, even though it had lost its um, cooling system, it, it's, it's cryogenic. That is, you put liquid, uh, in this case, solid hydrogen and liquid helium for it to um, keep cold. Uh, but once those evaporated, it couldn't do it in all the different wavelengths, but it still could do a couple of infrared wavelengths. And it's been studying the sky and mostly looking for near Earth objects like asteroids and has de de detected multiple comets. Uh, there's other ones that are, uh, telescopes that the JPL hasn't been involved with. There's the New Star Telescope. It's a high energy X-ray telescope. And there's the Galaxy Evolution Explorer, which flew in 2003 for about 10 years. Uh, but New Star is still continuing, by the way, but uh, Galax finished its mission, but did a full UV survey of the sky. And then of course, the mission that is near and dear to my heart is the Spitzer Space Telescope. This was part of what were called the Great Observatories by NASA. These were observatories that were meant to exploit being outside the Earth's atmosphere. The Hubble Space Telescope was the first and most famous, then the Chandra X-ray Observatory, then the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, and Spitzer was the fourth of the Great Observatories to do infrared wavelengths starting at three and a half microns all the way out to 160 microns. And just as a reminder, our eyes work between 0.4 and 0.7 microns is the wavelength range that our eyes work. Longer than 0.7 microns is infrared, but then this is longer infrared, mid and far infrared. Of course, when I'm talking about infrared observatories, everybody's uh, what's on everybody's mind right now is, of course, the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, this is not run out of JPL, although many people say James Webb is the successor to Hubble. That is not correct. Uh, James Webb is primarily the successor to Spitzer because in, in terms of wavelengths, the wavelength overlap between Spitzer and uh, James Webb is much larger than the wavelength overlap between Hubble and um, Webb. But at the same time, these are all complementary observatories. Webb is going to be doing all the follow-up of the science that Spitzer uh, was able to establish, as well as expand on the shorter wavelength observations that are provided at high resolution by Hubble. But then now it's giving us higher resolution um, infrared observations. But the reason I'm bringing it up is there is a JPL connection because the mid-infrared instrument, so uh, James Webb has instruments that start working at 0.6 microns out to and and then um, all the way out to um, five microns. And those were built by other institutions. But the instrument that works from five to 25 microns, which are the longest infrared wavelengths that uh, James Webb can work at, was partly built at JPL. It's a joint effort between the NASA and the European Space Agency and JPL and Goddard were the critical um, centers that helped build this. And in particular, JPL helped build what's called the cryocooler um, uh, and the, quiet, uh, the critical part of this was originally with, so this way we wouldn't have to uh, go with consumables. That is, we wouldn't have a liquid helium doer. And then if it wants to work liquid helium, we ran out, the instrument wouldn't work anymore. That's not the case. It's like a refrigerator. It keeps the instrument cold. I mean, we're talking about cold in the sense that it keeps it colder than six and a half degrees Kelvin. And so that's one of the famous images, of course, is from Miri. And this is the Southern Ring. Um, and as you can see, much higher resolution than we could get with Spitzer, but still, you know, wonderful detail, wonderful sensitivity. And I would like to highlight in particular something that is tangentially connected to JPL because the Infrared Processing and Analysis Center, which was set up at Caltech to um, do the data and uh, run the mission for IRAS, the first infrared all sky survey from space. Um, and now is basically the main repository of infrared data uh, for NASA, also has generated this 
a website called astropix.org. The job of Astropix is to take all sort of press release images, ingest them, and then add information, which is sometimes hard to come by whenever you're looking at a press release image. First of all, where is it in terms of RAN deck? So if you're an amateur astronomer, you can easily find it. Uh, how far away is it you know, from us? But the thing that I find the most interesting, and this is the critical part, because whenever you're looking at things that your eyes cannot see, you have to translate them. You have to map the wavelengths that you have detected to wavelengths that we can see. And so we have this very nice chart down here that shows that what the dark blue, light blue, or green and red wavelengths that you see the, that we've used to make this image are representing, in this case, 7.7 .7 microns, 11.3 microns, 12.8 microns, and 18 microns. For the red, for example, it's 18 microns. So this is done for all the different kinds of uh, images that are, you know, so we take the press release images and do this, and we've done this already with all the release web images. So if you want to basically get a apples to apples comparison, just go there. Now, all of them will be different colors, but then you can see what the mapping of those colors is to whichever wavelengths web is using, as well as you know all these other telescopes. So you can do a very easy comparison so that you'll know that, for example, if something you know has, and what we generally do is longer wavelengths are mapped to red wavelengths, middle wavelengths for whatever you've taken are mapped to green wavelengths, uh, green colors, and the long, the shortest wavelengths, highest energy is usually mapped to blue colors. So blue, very much like for what we see with our eyes, is the highest energy shortest wavelength. Greens are the middle wavelengths. Reds are the longest wavelengths. That's what we see. And then we translate them for whatever other wavelength region that we're looking at so that you can see that. And astropix.org is a great place to get all of these images. And all, um, again, these are not all images that have been ever taken, but all the press release images. And I'm going to stop there. And as we're, uh, one of the things that I find is most useful is to actually answer your questions rather than keep telling you what I think you should know. So please feel free to ask me any questions about the history of JPL, history of NASA, astrophysics, or anything else along those lines. Thanks so much. Dave, one of the uh, benefits of being program director is you get first right of refusal on questions. Thank you. So uh, we have uh, a couple have... of people in our audience as well, but uh, why don't you get started? I, I have to say, I did not know about the scandalous aspect of the early history of JPL. I mean, a a person blowing himself up to bits who's involved in what could be loosely called as devil worship. And I mean, you can't make this up. I mean, this is what a great story. Uh, I'd love to add. And then his mother committed suicide after he blows himself up. Um, uh, yep. I, I have to tell you that one of the things I do when I do my, my school, I, I do, I, I dress up as a wizard and go out to schools and libraries and I, I do pyrotechnics. And so this is all coming very close to home with me. <laughs> but I, I would love to have you tell us a bit more about, about him and, and also uh, the, the Aerojet general uh, relationship as well. Um, I believe I once met a, I think he was a, a German scientist who worked on the V2 program, if I remember, who went to work at Aerojet after the war. So do you know anything about that? And but tell us more about the scandalous aspect. I well, the scandalous aspect was that, yeah, Jack Parsons was very much into the occult. I mean, he was, he truly believed as much as, and I suspect, and this is my interpretation, that there were so many barriers that were being broken at the time in terms of scientific inquiry and, you know, and, and engineering. He, I think he truly felt that this was just the same as all the others, that, you know, that this, you know, talking to other dimensions, these demon dimensions and so on would just, it's just another thing if you just do it right and you have the right tools that you will be able to do that. So he was truly very much devoted to this. This was not um, a minor thing for him. Uh, he, he, this was a big part of his life. And he did become very uh, good writing uh, friends with Alistair Crowley in England. They exchanged a lot of letters about how to do what was this, the name of this particular thing was called Telema. Um, and again, they, it was very, I mean, it existed, he got into it, and then he wanted to take it further. Uh, and he, there was a sort of power struggle between him and Crowley about how to proceed. Um, but yeah, he, that was very much uh, part of that. And he also had this very close relationship, bizarrely close relationship with his mother, as he himself described it. And so when word of his um, accidental death came out, 
his mother did commit suicide. Wow. And, and, but separate from that, his friends who knew that the police would be showing up to and do the investigation were trying to paint over the pentagrams and things as quickly as possible. Oh, before wow. The police showed up. Uh, so yeah, this was, again, a very, very bizarre kind of thing. And in many ways, we've seen not, not all um, gifted people are bizarre in one way or the other, but we oftentimes see, do know that, uh, that one comes with the other. Oh, it never and, happens in our club. No. <laughs> I'm sure not. You are, you're, you're all, you know, completely yeah. within the middle of the Gaussian distribution that's, that's, of, oh, oh, yeah. that's right. personalities, uh, I am sure. Uh, point, point zero, 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 one standard deviations. Um, but, uh, and we love to make math jokes too, but that's normal. Um, uh, I wanted to ask you though, uh, the the dam that you said it was Devil's Gate Dam or something like that. Yeah, it's called Devil's Gate Dam. It's still did, there. I mean, did he choose the location because of the name? Is that a possibility? It's hard to tell. I don't know. Maybe, possibly, but be, what if, if if that was the case? Why is JPL there? What a great question on yeah. on a on a trivia test, yeah. you know, because of the name of the dam. That would be just an amazing association. I'm not going to go. I, I, I've never but, seen anybody actually say that, but that may have played a part in it. By the way, all of these people tended to live together. And there was a, they had a big house that they rented together and they lived together, which also involved, you know, at the time, what was called free love. Oh, yeah. Uh, so um, so that was actually a big part of it. That's why his uh, the book about his uh, occult interest is called Sex and Rockets. So there's just there were many many taboos that they were breaking both intellectual and scientific and engineering, but as well as all of these other things. And then so, the L. Ron Hubbard stuff. You're making that stuff up, aren't you? That nope, connection. Nope, nope. There, there's an actual court case. They went into business with these uh, to uh, buy boats and sell them. You know, buy here and sell them there. Something I don't remember the details, but L. Ron uh -huh. Hubbard, who was supposed to transport the boat, never took it to where it was supposed to go. He just went off, and he went off with. Jack Parsons' wife. So there was a big lawsuit, and oh. I mean, there's there's court records that he had the lawsuit. Just, you know, give me my boat back or the money, etc. And, so, uh, and, and never mind about my wife, but I want the boat. Well, <laughs> yeah, you can't get a court order to even then to to force <laughs> her to come back. But eventually, <laughs> they did reconcile. Wow. Um, so uh, things seem to be looking up for him. Things. I mean, he always had financial difficulties again because he was very. He was pushed out of Aerojet Corporation primarily because he was not interested in running a company. He was much more interested into the, in the secretaries rather than the company. Yeah. Um, and so uh, they were happy to sort of show him the door. But here's the critical part, though, is that it wasn't just that, oh, well, he's no longer here. Uh -huh. Is very Soviet style. They started erasing him from pictures that he wow. had. Oh wow! And so when you buy Strange Angel, you know the book has the images of the official photo, which had Jack Parsons removed, and the original photo where he's in the photo. Crazy. But it, I mean that. Thank you. I mean that just totally changes my yeah. view of JPL. <laughs> All right. Um, it was a different but, time. It truly really was. Yeah. But at the same time, that's the thing is we we always like the sanitized version or we get the sanitized version we yeah. don't necessarily like the sanitized we just usually get it and over time i think people are now comfortable enough to talk about it to know that that doesn't mean that this is what it is today that at least the what the intellectual inheritance that we got from those people was to be risk takers to do something that people didn't think could be mm -hmm. done and then make it happen by the way i just want to say kids love the non-sanitized versions of history and i think it's a great way to get people interested in this stuff i'm done for the moment all right. Uh, next question is from Randall. Randall, I'm going to allow you to talk. Give me a second here. Randall, are you there? Oh, you're going to have to unmute yourself. See if this works. Oh, brave new world. Brave new world. So far, not so brave. OK, well, that's not working, so we will. Uh... Go on to the next person. Try somebody else, Rich. I, yeah, hold on. You know, if you don't try, you don't succeed. That's mm -hmm. right. Uh, Mateo, you had raised your hand. Yay. And let's see if... Uh... Okay. There you are. Hey. So, um, yeah, I heard you say that the James Webb was kind of like a successor to the Spitzer telescope. And you said um, the James Webb had like a cryogenic device on it. Was that also a device used on the Spitzer to help keep it cool? No, that's the thing. That's why Spitzer um, uh, Spitzer had a much more limited lifetime because it did not have what's called a cryocooler. 
so it's uh, a cryocooler is a refrigerator. And um, so Spitzer flew with what's called a Dur, which is basically like a thermos full of liquid helium. And um, that liquid helium was used to cool the instruments. Now the telescope, as you can see for Spitzer, there's a shield that's, if you can see behind me here. So you can see there's a shield that's protecting the telescope and the telescope on this side is black. So it's radiating its heat away. The shield is protecting the opposite side from any sun from falling onto it. And initially it was, and it's, it was put in what's called an earth trailing orbit. So it's not uh, orbiting the earth. It's not even at L2 where James Webb is. It was trailing the earth slowly falling behind. And so it put it in a very cold position. And what ended up happening, which basically allowed it to go down to five degrees Kelvin to do these very long wavelength observations, because anything that's warm emits light. The, light, the warmer something is, the more light and other wavelengths of light that it emits. But as you make it colder and colder, it emits less and less light. So you don't want your telescope emitting light that, you know, if it's trying to detect infrared light, if it's emitting its own infrared light, that's terrible. So it had this dewer fill of li filled with liquid helium and it lasted about five and a half years. It was required to last two and a half. So five and a half was a big success. But then after that, we didn't have uh, the temperature to do all the different wavelengths. We had a much more limited wavelength range, which we could observe, which we did. And it was very successful and we did a lot of great science with it. With James Webb, originally the MIRI instrument was had a giant doer again, but then it was just going to last again five years or so. And they said, "Can we do this with a refrigerator? That is, we get is there enough power that we can get from the sun to cool it down enough?" And the problem with any refrigerator, as I'm sure you know, your refrigerator in anybody's house is that as soon as it's working, it goes. Brrr, brrr. You can't have a cryocooler shaking your telescope to keep it cold. But this is a cryocooler that made it work, and we can see it how well it's working. That it has no vibrations that it transfers to the telescope. So, wow. and it can get the instrument, not the entire telescope, but the instrument and the detectors. That part of it can get be brought down to less than six and a half degrees Kelvin. What's the coolant? Uh, I don't know what the coolant is in the sense that uh, I'm. I think it's uh, it's it's helium gas as well. But this is not just liquid helium boiling off and cooling you down. This is, you know, the, it's a closed system. like the gas in your air conditioner that, you know, that gets compressed and expanded and compressed and expanded. But uh, it's not that it's a much more complicated cooler. And that's a little bit beyond my knowledge at this point. All right. We have a question uh, from one of our uh, Facebook attendees uh, from Curtis. Uh, has there ever been an interest based on what you were talking about on the name of JPL? Um, in changing the name of JPL from Jet Propulsion Laboratory to reflect its focus on rockets or spacecraft? No, I think partly because already it became a brand so quickly initially yeah. that, you know, the, with the JATO units and so on and so forth, already was well, well known that that's where things were being done with the rocket development. So people already knew JPL as it was. What's interesting is that we don't work on rockets anymore. I mean, that's the thing. That is so uh, much in the past now. So uh, our main thing is just space, robotic space exploration. So right now, and again, JPL, that name is associated with the robotic space exploration. So changing it seems like a little bit of a, a backwards step in terms of people's recognition of what we are. Uh, it's just, I just wanted to mention it in the sense of to really drive home how much what they were doing was out of favor to the point that they would want, nobody wanted to be associated with that name of rocketry at that time. All right. Um, Bill, I don't know, it, it, you know, the talk isn't really about the James Webb Space Telescope, but uh, somebody did ask a question on whether uh, part of the James Webb mission, um, is it going to attempt to see uh, uh, the universe before the formation of stars and galaxies, uh, looking at cosmic microwave uh, background or anything No, that's else. the thing. So um, uh, NASA had, had a mission called the Microwave Anisotropy Probe. So it's, it's right. had multiple missions to study the microwave background. And then it had a joint participation with the European Space Agency for the basically the preeminent microwave background mission called the Planck mission. They do a great job on, on that. Uh, and so we have a great deal of information about the microwave background. So we know that that's about you know, a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. Then we have this gap in knowledge. Well, there's to the point where the very first stars form. 
And so really James Webb's job is to get at those very early stories. Uh, and so its wavelength sensitivity is designed for uh, the very early stars in the very earliest part of the universe after the microwave background. Um, because microwave background comes from a time when the universe is initially opaque and then it becomes transparent for light to travel through. That's why we can see it, uh, the light from the microwave background. But then that actually, then the gases are now um, not being bounced around by the light anymore. So now the gas can uh, collapse and start forming stars. And so what we want to see is this, those very first stars, or at least uh, the very first structures that then lead to stars and so on and so forth. So uh, James Webb is really trying to pick up all of that um, uh, sort of stellar and galaxy evolution sort of as, as early as we can go. Now, those wavelengths very early on are likely to be, again, like most star formation is today, is ultraviolet light and optical light. But because of the expansion of the universe, all of that light is now being shifted into the infrared. And so that's why James Webb has to be in the infrared, even though it's looking at ultraviolet light at that very early time from mm -hmm. those very early stars, hopefully we can see. It. And we can already see it's amazing how how uh, faint things it's already picking up. So we're very much interested in seeing what are the earliest uh, um, galaxies and stars in those galaxies that we can pick up. It's quite ironic that we're using an infrared telescope to observe ultraviolet events. Yep. Yep, but that's what it is. That's what we're driven to. Um, what's what's next for JPL? What 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 are they assembling now um, a, on on the floor? What are the next uh, missions so, uh, that they're excited a, about? Uh, there's a lot. There's an Earth Observing mission, which is a radar mapping mission of the surface of the Earth, um, uh, and it's a joint mission with the Indian Space Research Agency. From uh, and so that will be launched next year, um, and it comes again from all of this effort that JPL has done on radar. We did a radar mapping of Venus. We've done a radar mapping of Earth, uh, and this one is basically to do using radar to study um, uh, various aspects of, uh, I think, partly tectonic motion, but also you know penetrate the have ground penetrating radar to study underneath. Um, I believe it's called Neurus, uh, but um, apologies for forgetting the name. Um, but then in terms of planetary science, of course, the big thing is um, the Europa Clipper mission, uh, huh. the Europa, the moon of Jupiter, which was first observed to be very, you know, very odd by the first Voyager missions to see how it was. Unlike all the other moons, it didn't have craters. It was very smooth. And then, you know, Voyagers one and two flew by and this was just insanely, you know, People, what's going on here? And it's like, oh my God, there must be a liquid ocean underneath all this ice. And Galileo flew by it multiple times. And now they initially they didn't know this. It wasn't until the Cassini mission saw geysers off of the moon of Saturn called Enceladus. They went back to the Galileo uh, data and looked for it, and they found geysers on the from the surface of um, Europa as well. Oh, really? Yeah. So. Right. Um, it, it was, uh, but not an imaging. It was a, from a different instrument. But, but they basically analyze that instrument. And they're like, oh my God, these must be the effects of geysers. And so Europa Clipper mission is a mission to go and really study with ground penetrating radar and various other instruments to see where would is there really a liquid ocean underneath that, all of that ice, um, or is it just slushy ice? You know, there's clearly something like that. But if there is a liquid ocean, then where's the best place to land? What's the thinnest part of the ice and so on? So that, that's the next mission. It's called Europa Clipper. Um, there is a mission to an asteroid called Psyche, which will be launching probably in about a couple of years. It was supposed to be launched this year, but unfortunately it got delayed. But on the astrophysics side, the things that I'm involved with now is another all sky survey and primarily, in the, again, in the infrared this time called the SphereX mission. And the critical part of this one is as opposed to just imaging what's in, at infrared wavelengths, what we're gonna be doing is taking very low resolution spectra of the sky. So now we're going to be looking at lots and lots and lots and lots of objects and get basic spectra for them in particular because you can get the spectra for the higher redshift stuff, you can get um, the redshift very quickly because again, images are good. James Webb is amazing or even, you know, there's a lot of little, you know, spots on the sky you can look at and get the individual, yeah. um, redshifts for these objects, but now you're getting it for almost the entire sky. Um, so yeah, this is going to That's be a mission that will launch in 2025. It'll be an Earth orbiting mission, but then it'll be cooled again 
cryogenic, uh, uh, with a cryocooler rather than with cryogenic, you know, doers. And so this is going to be a, another fabulous mission. Uh, again, it's it, we we tend to do this. We do this wide field survey, then we launch a pointed observatory that looks at much more narrow bits and pieces of all the interesting things that the wide field survey found. Now you get a better wide field survey, and then you launch a more pointed observatory to do all these things. But in particular with SphereX, because it's going to overlap with Webb, Webb is a you know it's got a very tiny field of view. It really is studying individual objects. It can't do surveys. Uh, that was the weird thing with Spitzer is the, uh, the advantage was that even though it was meant to study individual objects, it had such a wide field of view that it could tend to do huge surveys as well. Um, but then Spherix is going to do an entire survey of the sky, have basic spectra of a huge number of sources. And so now we can go back and then say, you know, what, what, what's this weird thing? What's this weird thing? Oh, let's go back with James Webb and look at that and analyze it better. So those are sort of the critical parts of uh, uh, the things that we do within sort of the earth science, you know, solar system science, astrophysics. And of course, oh, one thing not to forget is uh, Mars. And of course, the next step from Mars is the sample return. So JPL yeah. is working uh, with their partners in the European Space Agency to do the sample return that, um, excuse me, the Perseverance rover is now collecting all those samples and then to bring back those samples to Earth to analyze. Um, Masaki uh, mentioned that there have been uh, people proposing geoengineering solutions to global warming, uh, construction of space solar sunshades at L1, and all, all you know all kinds of almost science fiction style uh, projects. Um, does does JPL get involved in any? Because they they obviously study climate science extensively with the uh, spacecrafts that they have developed up to this point. Uh, do they actually have a group that? Uh, looks at geoengineering solutions or anything like Not that? Not particularly a group dedicated to it. That is, I think there have been a couple of cases where JPL has been asked to study various kinds of things, and we, we do these kinds of studies as well. Uh, I think there has been maybe one, but don't quote me on that. I uh, <laughs> uh, But I think the critical part of it is um, geoengineering just uh, is really, really fraught kind of thing. If you um, if you don't think that um, it can go, you know, things can go wrong when you try and do, you know, change your environment, just look up rabbits in Australia. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so again, we may be forced to this. Um, and I think then JPL would probably have a big role to play at that point. But I think until then, we want to know exactly, we want to contribute to exactly how this is happening, what are the critical points, and so on and so forth. And if at some point, you know, this has to be decided not at the NASA level, obviously, this has to be decided sure. at an essentially an international level to agree to do something like this. And, and you imagine yeah. filing the environmental impact report for that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because the environmental impact report is that this is a giant impact on the environment. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, I would say, uh, I think there's a lot of people who, uh, have talked about this, but I think this is certainly above my pay grade, but I think that's above NASA's pay grade as well. I mean, this is this needs to be on a national level that has to be decided, but even then, it has to be an international agreement that this is a good idea to begin with. So I think the best JPL and other NASA centers can do is study exactly what's going on, what are the pivot points, what are the critical points, where, what's being hit hardest at what point, and and see, you know, and if somebody, if there's no other choice, I mean, we know what we need, what needs to be done uh, outside of geoengineering, whether we're willing to do that. And again, that's that's a human problem. This is not, it's not a science problem at that point. All right, next question. Uh, Linda, I'm going to allow you to ask live if you'd like. Go ahead. You there, Linda? Let me ask you to unmute. Going once, okay. going twice. Oh, here she oh. is. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. How okay. you doing? Hey, it's so good to see you. And good so man. proud of all you folks up at Japan, uh, Chabot with your visit from the governor and Kamala Harris. Anyway, yeah, but they, they made us stay away. Yeah. Uh, Bridget, did you hear about that? We had the vice president <laughs> um, and uh, the governor at uh, Chabot. Um, yeah, I did. I saw the article. Yeah, they, they warned us not to go up there during the time. <laughs> <laughs> I, my question is this. Um, 
we have had people speaking at our club, actually Chris Chan, I don't know if you guys remember him from many years back, but he was working at Space Sciences on solar missions um, and ended up going back to the UK and has become a pretty renowned solar scientist there at the universities. Are you, is JPO working closely at all with, uh, you know, Imperial College and the London um, UK universities on any of these missions? Uh, I know that we are. I don't know any of the specifics, but definitely solar physics is a big part of what uh, JPL has done. In fact, I, I forgot to mention there's an emission to using CubeSats, or these are very small satellites, to array five of them to actually provide much higher resolution um, mm. uh, uh, understanding of sort of the particles coming from the sun. Um, it's a mission called Sunrise, and you can look that up into the details of that. So. And but again, JPL has been involved with solar missions significantly. Uh, it's involved with the solar probe mission as well. But uh, yeah, but it's generally almost every science topic requires um, collaboration across uh, borders. And in particular, we have very good collaborations with the uh, Europeans in general. I mean, we have very close collaborations with Canada, Europeans. Japan and now you know with up in Korea and India and so on. So these are all. It, it helps everybody to to be doing this. I think to get the best people who are working on on it, but as well as everybody's budgets are tight. And so when you put things in these budgets together, you can get more out of them from multiple countries. Anything else, Linda? Or is, uh... No, I, that great. I, it's fabulous. Yeah. All right. Nice to hear your voice. Um, yeah, you move too. Move on to uh, Mateo. Mateo. Hey. Hey. Um, I remember a while back, uh, JPL, I put like a message in one of the Mars rover parachutes. I was wondering uh, what, what led up to that, if there's other kind of hidden messages that JPL has done. Um, uh, primarily, that was the biggest one, I think, where they were sort of uh, had a hidden message with the, their mighty uh, things and just sort of challenged people to do decode the, the parish, what was written into the parachute. Um, as far as uh, hidden messages, there was in the Curiosity rover, there are holes in the wheels. Um, and originally, uh, part of it was that, you know, to, to leave marks, and it was important to see how many, how many rolls that had done. And so to leave marks, they had written the letters J, P, and L in the wheel of the rover so that if you, you know, took a picture back of the tread marks that were left on you know, Mars, you could see, you know, JPL, JPL, JPL. But then also it was trying to get you a sense of how, whether your wheels were spinning at all. So because you're not riding in the rover, you don't really get a sense of the traction that you're getting. And that's really actually important. Um, but then NASA said you couldn't write JPL uh, on Mars. It was, it was a NASA mission. And so what ended up happening, <laughs> they just put holes on there, except, you know, so that it would leave the holes there, except that it was three sets of three kinds of holes. And if you, and basically, if anybody knows Morse code, it was JPL being written in Morse code on Mars because of Curiosity's wheels. Um, so we didn't write it in English letters, uh, but so that's definitely one of the other ones that I know. Uh, I'm not sure of anything else more recently or even further back in the past. And I'm sure that's the case, mostly because uh, as, you know, scientists and engineers always, particularly engineers are very fond of that, but it's also, there's a big prank culture coming out of Caltech and there's a lot of Caltech people. And this is not quite a prank, but it's always nice to put sort of- It's, a, it's getting on. there. It, yeah. I would say that hidden messages on Mars is something that uh, Jack Parsons would have approved of. Well, probably, yeah. And, uh, Virgin, I just want to say that my wife uh, in, in JPL's honor is right now wearing her Dare Mighty Things parachute shirt. If you oh, very nice, that. very nice. So, All right, uh, Mark. Uh, Mark Staffarini, I'm going to have you ask your question. You're going to have to unmute, my friend. Are you there? Hello, Mark. Ah, uh, modern technology, isn't it? Yeah, I guess I guess that didn't work. Well, we got you know, we got a couple of them to work. This is amazing. I, I'm sorry, I didn't have a question. Oh, you didn't. You just raised no. your hand. No, I didn't mean to. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> okay, <Bye>. no worries. <laughs> Let me see another question here in chat from uh, Martin. This. Um, oh, this is an interesting question uh, from Martin. Um, 
Is any aspect of the climate getting better? By the way, Chabot um, is a wonderful place. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> again, I'm not a climate scientist, so I don't know as much. And so they can probably- Yeah, I have to use my headphones though, because I can't even get it loud enough on here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry about that. No, it's all right. No, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm not a climate scientist, so I really can't really answer that uh, with any kind of authority. So uh, I'm going to leave that to the climate scientists from what I've heard and what I've read, not at the moment. That is no, really not. it's uh, not. We're doomed. Well, we're not doomed. I mean, we, we remember, uh, people forget the ozone hole. There, we know that there was a distinct problem with yeah. you know, the kinds of chlorophyll Chloro -chloro -chloro gases chloro. that we were using in sprays and refrigerants and so on. And that was creating a hole in the ozone. And there was massive international effort. Countries came together, banned CFCs, and decades later, have, do you hear about the ozone hole? No, because we solved it. This is not as big a problem now because there was a big effort and people did come together and things happened. This is a much larger effort besides banning one sort of family of substances. But at the same time, we've done it before. So I'm, I'm, I myself, at least on that from I'm optimistic based on our previous track record, you know, Previous success is no guarantee of future success, of course, but I, th I think at this point there's a critical thing and it's becoming, you know, uh, we, we're living in California. Have we had brownouts this summer? No. Uh, have, we, have we had a much larger percentage of our power coming from renewables? Yes. Uh, so in that sense, I mean, something seems to be coming together, at least on the power grid in California, to the point where, you know, uh, we're not, you know, losing our air conditioning and even though it's much hotter now we have more people now than we did when we had brownouts about mm -hmm. what was it, 10 years ago and you know definitely critical problems and we've solved those problems or at least addressed them significantly without going to all these other you know non-renewables and now we have a much larger renewable uh, portfolio to which to, to draw from so things can happen you know how much of an impact it's having on the climate i don't know but at least those kinds of movements are happening uh, Matteo, your turn again. This is actually an idea from my brother, but um, has JPL ever like thought about having uh, I guess kind of like either uh, like capsules that just have a record of like like animal and like um plant life just like floating in space to kind of have like a record of Earth life or like just like self-sustaining ecosystems that just kind of float out there in space. I don't think we've ever done that. I mean, the the closest that we did was the uh. Voyager Golden Record that has, you know, sounds of Earth and images of Earth uh, recorded in 1976, basically, before it launched in 1977. Um, but I think in terms of some sort of a, a geo store like that, I don't think JPL is, I think that's something that wouldn't come out of JPL. That's something that would be mandated from, you know, US government or from NASA or something like that to be done like that. Uh, I think at this moment, what I do know is that there's, you know, stores like that, um, on Earth, uh, it's not clear why it would be ideal to send it into space, um, uh, uh, because particularly it becomes, you know, space is a really harsh environment to keep anything in terms of living. So on Earth, you know, there's a seed store I know that there's just massive, every seed that's ever been basically, there's you know, not only the genetic code of it, but the seeds have themselves been stored and in a very, you know, frozen place up somewhere, somewhere, so. All right. Um, anyone else? Anyone else I, on Facebook? I have to tell a story, oh, which is related. It. There is a relationship between JPL and Chabot, <clears throat> and I, I find it a, quite an amusing and, and interesting one. And it dates back to 1957, after Sputnik went up, but before um, Explorer went up, uh, a 12-year-old boy visited uh, Chabot at our old location. And this young boy was in the Bay Area because his father was a captain of the Coast Guard and working in Government Island. And uh, he asked, uh, he was very interested in space exploration and astronomy. And he asked our old director, Kingsley Whiteman, if he thought we would ever get to Pluto. And uh, this is, remember, we just had just orbited Sputnik. That's all we had done. And uh, Kingsley thought about it for a few, few minutes and a few seconds and said, no, he didn't think we'd ever get to Pluto because it was too far but he thought that someday we'd get to Jupiter and Saturn. And that young boy grew up to be Torrance Johnson, who Ooh. was of course the chief of the, the imaging for, uh, for Galileo and for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for Galileo and also for Voyager. And I got that story directly from Torrance himself because uh, 
my our, our preceding uh, program director had urged me to get him to come up to Chabot. And, and I said, Norm, there's no way I can get a famous scientist like Torrance Johnson to fly up to Chabot, fly up to the Bay Area just to give an EAS talk. And he said, yes, you can. And he, I, so I asked Torrance uh, why I was able to, and Torrance told me the story. So well, that's one cool. of the connections very between, you can add that to your, to your, your, your history of JPL, what you talked about. Um, and I'm sure that's that's why uh, outreach is so incredibly important because when you're talking to those little kids out in the audience, you can never tell who they're going to be someday. And so treat each of them with the the, the greatest respect you possibly can for all of the potential that is intrinsic in them. All right. Well, on that note. Um... Oh, I have one more thing to say. Oh, go for it. Me. Go ahead. Oh, so uh, I want to just uh, give a plug. I, again, people have accused me for being too much of a JPL fan, but I'm sure Virgin thinks that's impossible. Um, a next month speaker is also from Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and that is Teddy Zanetos. And I hope I'm pronouncing his Greek last name properly. Teddy is the director now of, of Ingenuity, the drone that is currently flying on Mars. And so I'm very excited about this talk as well. And he's going to tell us how you fly. A, a drone on Mars and all the interesting engineering and things that they have to think about when they do this. It should be a very exciting talk and I hope you all attend. Great, well, thank you. And uh, thank you, Barajan. And uh, it was nice to meet you. And Dave, uh, thanks for everything. And uh, everybody have a nice weekend. Thanks a lot. It was all a right. pleasure to talk to everybody. So long, everyone. All right, Take care. So thank you now. very much.